Welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network, coming to you from the TeacherCast studios since 2011. Join us each week as we bring you the latest educational news, ed tech updates, and hottest interviews with today's most influential leaders in education. And now, for your host, Jeff Bradbury. Hello and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury and welcome to Digital Learning Today. On today's episode, we're gonna be talking all about artificial intelligence. We're gonna be defining what it is, how school districts are currently taking advantage of it, and how you can safely deploy it in your classroom. I have a fantastic guest on today, Dr. Jane Lammers from Edmentum. Dr. Lammers, how are you today? Welcome to TeacherCast. Thank you, Jeff. I'm doing great. And I'm really looking forward to talking with you about this subject that everybody is talking about. I am so excited to have you on. You know, we've been talking about artificial intelligence here. It seems like forever. Every single time we have a guest come on, it's the topic that we have to bring up. But I'm excited about having you on today because we've never really had a chance to really start from ground zero, start from the beginning here. Uh, before we get into those fun questions, tell us a little bit about yourself and what's happening these days at Edmentum. Well, thanks for that invitation. So, uh, Jeff, I was a teacher educator for 15 years. I worked in higher education. I was a tenured professor at the University of Rochester. I was a Fulbright scholar who got to travel to Indonesia just before the pandemic and conduct research with a partner down there on the digital literacy practices of Indonesian youth. Um, had a lot of fun doing that and was uh, I ran um, an English teacher preparation program and also advised doctoral students and really enjoyed studying how young people use technology for their own interest-driven learning purposes. So that's where I kind of came from. I was an English teacher prior to going into higher ed. But as with many folks, the pandemic changed things, right? And I wanted to be closer to family. I wanted to have greater impact. There was something about the pandemic and the, emo uh, the remote emergency instruction that happened as a result that really put what I had been studying, which was how are people using technologies into the forefront and into the conversation. And then an opportunity came up and I am now the director of learning design at Edmentum. We are a K-12 digital curriculum provider. We aim to be the premier learning acceleration company that helps get young people all across the country and in countries around the world back up to speed and beyond in their learning. And we use technology to do that in a variety of ways. We have intervention programs. We also have fully online courses and a fully online um, academy. And so my job is to make sure that what we know about good learning is built into the design of our products. And when you say good learning, mm -hmm. how do you define that? Especially in 2024. What right? does good learning look like? What does good learning look like? Well, engagement is on top of mind for most of the educators I talk to and most of the school district folks. How do we actually get young people to be and remain engaged in the learning that happens in their formal schooling environments, especially after the years of disengagement? And what I would argue is couple that with all of the engagement that they get in other kinds of social media and other kinds of social learning spaces, young people need engaging learning. So that's the first definition of good learning. It's engaging learning. It meets learners where they are and then helps to leverage what they already do know and get them to where they need to be. I love that definition. Uh, j just a few hours before we did this recording, I brought home a Google Sheets project that I'm going to be giving in my middle school soon. And my, my middle school kids know that before they get any assignment, it has to pass a series of three tests. Mm -hmm. And those tests, of course, are my triplets. So tonight, my triplets were doing these Google Sheets homeworks. At, they're, they're in fourth grade. 
Okay. They were doing the middle school level work. And just as you were saying, meet the kids where they are, give them something engaging and just sit back and watch what it is. Edmentum, of course, is in 43,000 schools, hitting 420,000 educators and 5.2 million students in all 50 states. I'm looking forward to this conversation. You want to just dive right into this? Absolutely. Let's go. Artificial intelligence. This is obviously a topic that is near and dear to everybody. Some people are jumping in with two feet. Some school districts are not there yet. Some school Mm -hmm. districts are saying not until we get a policy. Some people are saying, what is a policy? Some people think that artificial intelligence is only chat GPT. We've got different terms, right? We've got generative AI. We've got design AI. We've got uh, text-based AI. We've got AI in in, in different products like Canva and and Adobe and Microsoft and all of these different things. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the hot seat here. Millions of educators have just stopped their cars and pulled over to the side. Jane, how do you define the term generative AI? When I'm talking about generative AI, I am talking about any of the tools that will generate new content because they are using the artificial intelligence that they have been programmed with to look for patterns, to call from whatever large language model usually, so whatever big batch of data they were given, to give the user a response or a creation, because it could be image-based if we're talking about something like DALI or Midjourney or in Canva, could be design-based, right? But it gives the user what it thinks it wants. What So that's important to note that it provides what it thinks you want based on the prompt you gave it and based on its training and um, in its model. That sounds like my triplets. Let me see what we can get a couple things here. If I go on to a, a Google search and I say, I need a recipe for cookies, is that generative AI? I'm putting in a prompt, it's giving me something. Is that generative AI? No, that's a search, right? And artificial intelligence might be involved in the search, but that's not necessarily generative AI. We'll say like when you're starting to type, give me a recipe and you see all the stuff that pops up below it, that is generative AI because here it is using its training to make a prediction to give you what it thinks you want, right? But it's just filling in the search right there, right? But what I'm talking about when I talk about generative generative AI is when you're using a tool like Microsoft Copilot, who any of the schools who are on Microsoft tools, they likely now have access, whether they use it or ignore it, to Copilot, right? To have a chat feature that they can put in and ask a question. And when you ask that program a question, unlike a Google search, you'll get a different sort of generative answer. You'll get a text-based answer, often with different sources. What Google gives you is a list of what it thinks are your most likely or best paid for choices to answer your question. And you then have to go out and look at the site that it links to you. What the generative AI tool will do with your question is it will create text that it thinks answers your question, pulling and synthesizing from a variety of sources. And, you know, while you're giving me that amazing answer, of course, I go on to Microsoft Copilot and I say, start a knock knock joke. And of course, it says knock knock. Who's there? Banana. So this is where artificial intelligence is, right? Um, If I go into these different programs, we know that there's, as you mentioned, a variety of different kinds. I think the the two biggies that are out there, ChatGPT and Mm -hmm. Microsoft Copilot, and I would even throw a third one in there. You know, Google has their Bard slash, they're not calling it Gemini, right? Right. And the scary part is these things are now starting to be turned on at the admin level. Yep. For school districts, right? right? So these this is not the AI world and then the school world. This is Microsoft is now every single day putting out videos going, here is Copilot with PowerPoint. Here is Copilot with Outlook. 
I, I got to be transparent. I'm personally one of those ones that are paying 30 bucks a month for Copilot. I love it. I mm-hmm. love the fact that I can sit, if nothing else, 30 bucks a month is paying for me to look at a strand of emails and have it read the emails and, and give me like a three sentence uh, synopsis of what the entire email thread is. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love that. Yeah, oh, it's a time saver, huge time, time saver. saver. Right. I'm still trying to figure things out. Last night I was doing a chat with a friend who was at a Rangers game and I said, you know, please take this picture and put it in a Rangers jersey and put the Stanley Cup. Like I was doing the designer.microsoft.com right. thing and we were just having fun with it, right? Right. And let me let me stop you there, Jeff, because what you're doing is exactly what I'm trying to advocate for to school leaders. You're playing with it. You're getting your hands in there. You're trying different use cases. The use case may be entertaining your friend. The use case may be digging through your email and saving yourself time. The use case may be for our teacher friends listening, designing a lesson plan or giving a student sample um, to meet the needs of their students, right? You've spent time to play and figure out where it could be useful for you And that's what we're advocating for our education partners to do. So at Edmentum, we ran a series of experiments to try to figure out how would we want to advise, especially last summer, everybody was talking about it. School districts had shut it down. We're trying to figure out what we could suggest to our partners. And so we got in there and started running experiments. And that's the kind of thing that we learned is that Teachers need or school district leaders need to get their hands in it, try different tools, see how they work so they can figure out where it might be useful for them. So I'd like to have this conversation from a couple different chairs. Okay, and I'll Mm -hmm. try to tell you the chair I'm doing the question from right now. I want to do this from the tech director chair. Okay. when I'm working with a company and they say they now are using artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. I know as a tech director, I need to have a privacy agreement signed with that company for my users to log in. Do I also need to ask questions such as where is that company getting their artificial intelligence originally sourced from? And do I need to worry about having a privacy agreement with that source? I think what you're hitting on with that question there, Jeff, that is on the minds of every tech di- director and the the legal folks in districts, right? Is how do the data that get put into an AI get used? So one of the benefits of using a Microsoft Copilot, for example, is the way that it's attached to any enterprise is it protects the privacy of the data. That data doesn't get fed into the model. But the important thing for teachers to know, if, for example, the only generative AI that they think of is ChatGPT, right? What they need to know is that ChatGPT will take anything that you input into it, and it starts to use it to train the model. So the question from a tech director seat is, Probably yes, they need to figure out where, what a company is using and which data, like whether or not the data gets shared, you're, you're safer if they're using Microsoft Copilot. And there's also all, almost always, as I've seen it, data sharing agreements or not that protect the privacy. So even as an ed tech company, uh, all of the same rules and regulations um, for protecting student data apply to us as they do to a school district. So we can't use and share an email and and feed into a system any student data. When a tech director is looking at an application or when an application comes to a tech director that says, hey, now we have this extra thing on us, what questions should a tech director be asking of their ed tech partners when it comes to the topic of AI, AI features, perhaps can I turn the AI features on and off on my side or are they now just a part of this world? What questions should school districts be asking? Well, I think lots of people are asking questions around like age restrictions. So those keep changing. Um, I, I would also, speaking of the idea of changing, this 
landscape and these technologies are ever changing, right? All of the models keep getting updated. So I might want to ask if I were a tech director, how will I be notified of changes to the model? Um, I think it is a good question to ask. Is there a way to limit access, turn features on and off? Um, the other thing to note about the perspective that I bring um, from Edmentum is that we're not putting AI into our products at this point. We've taken a more kind of cautious approach. Um, we're absolutely looking at use cases for our own efficiencies and the work that we need to do to create things. But when it comes to in our products, no, rather what we're doing is trying to figure out how to help teachers who use our products think about when, when and if or how students might use AI to complete assignments, what they should worry about or not when it comes to that, and how to have the teachers find their own efficiencies with AI in terms of using our products. I, I want to throw one more question at you from the tech director chair, and this is a biggie. And okay. there are there are th there are spreadsheets running around the internet right now that have all of this information, but I think there's a lot that's premature right now. Do you have any recommendations? I know you're not legal, right? Mm -hmm. But do you have any recommendations on language that should be in, or things that should be in some kind of a, an official board doc AI policy? I know school districts are jumping in, but they don't have an AI policy. Some school districts are saying. Why do I need one? And then there's some school districts that are, they're making the document that everything is in there. Do you have any recommendations or do you, do you have a chance to, to see what other school districts and stuff are doing? So uh, I've had a couple of opportunities to see what other school districts are doing. Um, one of the things I do on the side is I still, I, I couldn't leave academia altogether. So I still teach an instructional technology course at the University of Pennsylvania. And I taught it last fall. And the course gets taught to school leaders. And so I had a cohort of 20 something school leaders. And of course, in an instructional technology module, we were talking about generative AI and policy. So I got to see some of the policies that those um, folks as, as my students, but in their day jobs were creating in their districts. I've also been following what New York City schools have been doing, right? They were one of the first school districts to ban ChatGPT when it first came out, when everybody was trying to figure things out. And now we see that they have come around and created a more thoughtful approach. They've got you know, a group working on it and they're trying to make things public. So I think if I were your tech director and I was in that chair, what I would do is I would probably go look to some of the bigger districts who have the resources and the money and the manpower to be thinking about this more deeply and I would look to see what their current policy is and see what language might need to be included in my own district's policy. So let's take that hat off for a second here and let's okay. put on the coaching hat or okay. the coaching hat, right? One of the questions and, and, and topics that have come up on our Ask the Tech Coach show has been, how do you introduce this concept to teachers, right? Mm -hmm. we, we think of this as the calculator, right? Teachers are saying you can't use it, you can't use it, you can't use it, but now everybody has a calculator. Mm -hmm. And there's so many coaches out there right now that are jumping in and saying, can I have 20 minutes at a faculty meeting just to put that first toe in, just to have that conversation? Um, even myself as a technology teacher, I want to try this, but I don't want to teach my kids something i feel weird saying this i don't right. want to teach my kids something that the that my colleagues are going to be uncomfortable with them knowing right right so all of that being said if you were somebody who was in charge of professional development mm -hmm. how do and this is going to be a two part question how do you start the conversation what's an application that you would use do you have an example of maybe a first group assignment What's that 30 second pitch or speech or anything that you would do if you were that coach and you were given a faculty meeting and said, introduce the topic, but don't go too far in the water? Right. I love this question. So this I have actually done a bunch of thinking about is how to get it started. 
I think I would take a problem that is broad for most of my colleagues. And I would venture a guess that most of your listeners are dealing with the challenge of the various languages that our students come to our classroom speaking and their families, right? We have a huge variety of multilingual learners um, who are trying to learn our content, but they still don't know the English language that we're speaking to them in. So one of the things that I might show my colleagues if I were a coach is I'd show them, uh, we found Claude AI, which is one that we have not yet mentioned, um, but Claude AI was the tool that we found at the time when we ran our experiments a few months ago was the best at taking a prompt and you put it in there and you ask it to translate that prompt and explain the concept to a speaker of, say, for example, Moroccan Arabic. So what Claude AI does, it's better than Google Translate, which just gives you a one-to-one -one translation and who knows how good it is. But what Claude AI does is it will give you the translation, explain in both English and in the language of choice, the target language, why it made choices that it did um, to explain the concept and to make it more accessible. So if you've got a teacher who's got students who are speaking maybe a handful of languages in their class and they're just trying to teach them math, and you're trying to explain to them the Pythagorean theorem and how that works. And you need your multilingual learners to understand it. I might show them how that works and how easy that is to give them the explanation that will allow them to differentiate. The next thing I'd do is I'd say, so who's interested in learning more? And I think professional development in this area needs to start with a coalition of the willing. So bring together the teachers who aren't fully afraid of it, who want to dip their toes in the water. And what we advocated when we wrote about this last year, um, we advocated for bringing this group together and creating a culture of experimentation. So getting the school to give them some space, some time, maybe some professional development hours to start running their, their own experiments, to start using these different tools to see what works. There's also, we haven't talked yet about all of the generative AI that are school focused, right? That are not these other ones. So like school AI, magic school, these ones that essentially take a chat GPT engine, put it in a wrapper and start to program it and give it a personality and a persona that meets different grade levels or subject areas and starts to do some of the design work for teachers. So it lessens the load, the burden about designing your own prompts. And just have these folks experiment and learn about the different cases that it might work and then let it start to spread. When you're looking, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go back a hat. Okay. When you're looking at, you know, here's Claude, here's mm -hmm. Magic School. Mm -hmm. You're suggesting that this be at the teacher level which to the best of my knowledge means I don't need to worry about privacy agreements? Or is this where you go to your tech director as the tech coach and say, I'd like to try this Claude thing, go get an agreement. So I can now go do a, my, my, my 30 minute faculty meeting. What's, what's the, do you know the legalities on that? At what point does school districts need to be reaching out to all these different companies? Um, there's no students like you, you have not right. yet said student logs into, right. Right. But you're still asking teachers to log into that. And, and that's kind of where I am right now is I'd love to start trying these things, but I don't want to be crossing the district line that I might not know exists. As the director of learning design, thankfully the legal aspect of it is not my purview. So I am not the best person to answer that question. Fair. Okay, so you're the tech director. So you're you're the tech coach. You, right. you I, and I love the idea. Let's have a conversation with a problem. The problem mm -hmm. is I've got students that I need to be able to communicate with. Here's how this works. If anybody else wants more, and we talk a lot on this show about the innovation curve, where you, once you get to that 13 mm -hmm. or so percent, now you got your first followers. Right. How do you get to that next 23 percent to get your? We talk about that one a lot on here. Excellent. What? other ideas do you have for 
bringing these topics in. By the way, and I love coming coming from a school district that supported 75 languages and being the guy that brought in things like PowerPoint Live and Microsoft Translate and here's the app. I love the idea for MLLs. Mm -hmm. What's the dog and pony, right? Is the dog and pony, here's designer.microsoft, give me a prompt and it's going to make a picture. Now now go try something. Like, give me, give me, what's the next thing outside of MLL students? Um, I think I I think you'll get most teachers to buy in and want to understand more if we help solve problems for them. So I don't actually think it's the cool whiz bang dog and pony. Uh, even I myself don't always appreciate what an AI tool can do in terms of making a presentation look better because I've got you know years of doing a presentation. That's not a problem I feel like I'm trying to solve. So I think if you go at problems that teacher, like authentic problems that teachers are trying to solve mm. and then think about it. So I think there's always the problem of differentiation. So we talked about multilingual learners, but another way of thinking about differentiation. So. A lesson I have learned when it comes to generative AI is you always need to keep humans in the loop. You cannot just totally rely on what the generative AI produces for you. You've got to keep checking it. And so that's why I think we'll never see AI fully replace teachers. We need their humanity and their understanding and their relationships with kids in the loop. So one way that we can leverage that is, say this is a middle school teacher in your context, and they have multiple classes of kids, and they're still, again, trying to teach maybe a social studies concept or a math concept, but they've got five sections of kids. And they all like different things. And the teacher can't keep coming up with all of these different examples. You can give it a prompt that says they like that. Now give me an example to teach X math concept to all of these kids. And it will generate it in seconds. And I love that you just said that because a couple of weeks ago I was teaching my kids how to do autobiographies. And right in front of them, I opened up Copilot and said, I need an autobiography that has this, this. And I basically plugged in what their assignment was. Mm -hmm. And the kids were just like, wait, how'd you do that? And that was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. But let me put on my third hat here. As the technology teacher, as somebody who's in the classrooms, mm -hmm. I'm still nervous to show this stuff to my students, even though it's on my accounts, even though you know they're not getting their hands on it. I still feel like I'm the guy that's teaching them how to use the calculator when the math teacher says no calculator, right? Right. I still feel like if I go in there and I show them how to use these things, eventually they're going to find the and I don't want to be blamed as the as the guy who's teaching them all the back doors. Right. So we talked about when you're doing the PD, help the teacher solve the problem, get them interested, and then you start to build from there. What advice would you have for anybody trying to show off artificial intelligence for to students yeah. but doing it in a way that's not the oh it's going to help me cheat i'm you know right. that stuff right how do you actually start to bring in this as a tool and we can discuss the canvas of the world and the fireflies like but how, what what's a good couple intro lessons for students so where i like to go is uh common sense education I don't know if you've looked at, they're really well known for their digital citizenship curriculum. And they've now uh, put out a series of lessons for students on AI that explains what it is um, and also kind of takes this digital citizenship approach to teaching and learning about AI. So I would probably, if I were in your shoes as the tech teacher, I'd probably start there with their lessons because you're building an understanding of the tool, not just showing the cool whiz bang, how it would help me kind of a thing. So I think it's really important when we're talking with students that we help them understand what the tools do and don't do. We help them understand the biases that are built into them. Um, we help them understand um, what they need to look out for that they can't just um, 
put in a prompt and turn in whatever it spits out. So again, translating the humans in the loop back to them. I would start with that resource and that collection of lessons as my first place to go. Then I would probably, if your school allows you, you know, you've asked, you've raised a bunch of important questions about um, the legalities of data sharing and having the right agreement. So let's say you do have permission to show it and your school has worked out all those legal details. I would probably start with the brainstorming capacity that AI does. So not doing the finished product part of it, because that's where some of your colleagues are probably um, kind of got their hackles up about cheating and the potential for cheating. And until we get all of our colleagues to change their pedagogy from the kinds of assignments that could be replicated and spit out by a generative AI, what I think we're best to do with the youth is to teach them how the tools could be a thought buddy, a brainstorming partner, an idea generator. Tools like ChatGPT are great for that. All of these topics that we're talking about are gonna be detailed in our show notes. I'm making sure that we have links to all the different AI tools. Uh, I found the link to the Common Sense article. And speaking of articles, Dr. Lammers, you recently at Edmentum uh, published an article about generative AI, and that mm -hmm. article was called AI in Education Experiments, Lessons Learned. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about this post and specifically what have some of the lessons been that you and your team have learned about AI? Well, I've already shared a couple of them. So the, the experiment from Claude and translating comes directly from that article um, that you'll link to. The other thing that we did is um, the needing to try different tools and to try them over time to see how they work and how they change. So to see whether or not ChatGPT might be better at something versus um, Copilot versus Gemini versus Claude AI. Um, the other thing that when I go back to this idea of the coalition of the willing who are going to run experiments and try things, that <clears throat> I think this works best if they can then have the time and space to come together and critically reflect on what they've learned, to share resources, that there be created some sort of a hub. For us um, at Edmonton, we used a Microsoft Teams channel um, which we called our AI brainstorming hub. And any resource gets shared there so that anyone who's interested can follow along, can um, dialogue about it. So I, I think that idea of creating this space for experimentation is really helpful. The article also shares the lesson we've already talked about, about keeping humans in the loop, that you need to have um, People look over what the AI creates, find hallucinations, um, which that's another key term that we haven't touched on. But because of the way AI is, gener er, is designed, it could generate falsehoods that look very believable because, again, it's just trying to please you. It's trying to give you what it thinks you want. Um, and so if you get to the point where you are using AI with students, that article also has some lessons learned that specifically speak to work with students um, and this idea that we need to promote critical thinking and reflection on the student's part as they analyze AI's output. You mentioned Claude AI earlier about being a good tool for MLL. Mm -hmm. Have you, I wanna say this the right way, have you focused these AI tools for certain subjects. For instance, um, have you noticed that Copilot might be good at some subjects, but uh, Gemini is better at others? Um, I, I find there's people like, you know, in, in, in there's, there's people in certain circles that they're just going to try 100 different AI tools and they're going to always have 100 AI tools because they, they know what's there. Right. But the majority of teachers are either, I don't want it or show me the one that I need. Right. 
Right. Exactly. And, and in a school district, look, if you if you're a Google school, you're going to do this one. If you're a Microsoft school, you're going to do this one. If you're not, here are some other options. Uh, have you found some favorites yet? And and for specific reasons? Um, well, I, I know that when we were trying to get uh, trying to use chat GPT to do certain calculations, it couldn't always be trusted with the math. Now, I say that with a huge caveat that when we were doing our experiments, that was last year, that might as well be a decade ago in AI terms, right? So it is ever changing. Um, so I don't know that there is a great answer to your question definitively, Jeff. Um, I think that as these models continue to change, that's why we need a, a culture of experimentation. There is another form of AI that we haven't talked about yet. And, and I really haven't talked about it much on this channel because I'm still fascinated by how it works. And, and I'm just going to, I don't even know what this is specifically called, but I, I, I like the term second brain. So I, I call it your second brain AI and specifically things that they will look at all of your personal information and help you make decisions help Oof. you organize I'll, I'll give you two examples that, that help me run my life and help me run teacher cast i'm a big fan of of the application called notion and mm -hmm. notion is a note-taking application on on one level but it's also a way to create databases and note take and and you name it basically everything that you've ever seen on teacher cast for the last couple of years is designed in notion and recently notion came out with their own ai tool but instead of searching the world it's searching itself so when we say things like the term second brain, it, it literally is thinking for me. And I can actually go into the AI tool and I can ask it, tell me how many times Dr. Lammers was on the show and what the episodes were about. Mm -hmm. Maybe because in six months you're going to be back on and I want to make sure that we're having a similar yet different conversation. Or I can say, show me all the podcast episodes that we discussed artificial intelligence because maybe i'm doing a blog post on my top 10 whatever and i want to start to reference other shows so notion is a way that it'll actually take your your again your second brain it'll only think inside of that hmm. copilot is another option copilot depending on how you're using it and I, I i again i pay for it inside of my teacher cast domain as a switch that says internal, I forget what the exact words are, but basically it's internal of your domain or the web. Mm -hmm. So if I click on the internal switch, and I don't remember the, the name of it, but I can say, show me all of my podcast episodes, and it'll find only the podcast episodes inside of my OneDrive. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I search the web, now it's basically doing a Bing search. Mm -hmm. And so I love these companies that are coming up with ways for us to do more using the tools that we're currently building, mm -hmm. right? So I spend a lot of time on my notion, on my dashboards, on my, I'm making sure that everything is there and named correctly. Cause I know someday soon I'm going to need to pull that information out. And the same thing with Microsoft. Microsoft is checking all of your PowerPoints and words and Excel's and, mm -hmm. and it's checking the entire knowledge graph out there of yourself so that way you can find what you need. Now, obviously, if I'm searching my own stuff, it doesn't know what you as my coworkers doing. Right. But that's okay, because I don't always want to know what the entire planet's doing. I just want to know what's in my own bedroom, right? Or my own house. Right. Do you have any experience using any applications like that? Or are you were shaking your head about about using the, the co-pilot stuff. Are, are you one or is your team one to be making these, you know, second brain, second thinking, you know, digital versions of yourself? And, and if so, have, do you have any suggestions on, on those? The only place that I have used this, I have not dug into this kind of second brain AI for myself very much beyond, you know, working in a corporation that uses Microsoft products and also Atlassian products, Confluence, right? We use SharePoint. We there's stuff on Teams, there's files that get emailed to you, all of this. So I often use the tool Delve 
in Microsoft to find, okay, I know this person sent me a file. Where is it? Um, help me find it. And so I don't have to search email and then search teams and then search, you know, Confluence. That's probably the best one that I use. And I use it regularly because I know I saw that file from somebody. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, right? There's a lot. And, and I think where we are right now is we're at that point in the curve where people are jumping on board or some of them are even saying, I, I, I don't, I don't have the time. Like mm -hmm. there's so much stuff, grades, curriculum, parents, post pandemic behavior. I don't have time for one more thing. Right. And you've got this wave of educators coming in going, no, 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 this is the thing. Right. And, and even a couple of shows ago, we did the, you know, how, how would you relate AI to other recent things? And we're like, no, th this isn't Google cardboard where many people tried and now it's in the corner. Like, this is the thing, right? Like, this is the thing that we're going to look at and go, this isn't going anywhere. Mm -mm. This is the calculator that suddenly you turn around and everyone's got one in their pocket. Like, everything is going into here. So how do we learn? And, and, and let's, let's, let's take one final lap around here. If you were listening to this show and you, you wanted to take that first step to try things, as you said, button push, test things out, play with things, what would be one of the first things that you would do or the first applications that you would look towards just to sit in your office one day and push some buttons? Well, if I'm at a school that uses Microsoft, I would use Microsoft Copilot because it's probably the easiest one to know that the data is protected. So I won't get in trouble. If I'm not at a school that uses that, I just go to ChatGPT because there's a lot talked about ChatGPT, and so I could find resources easily. So I'd pick one of those two, whichever one is the most accessible. And then I would sit down and think about what are all of the repetitive tasks that take me lots of time? And how might I find or try myself a, a prompt that helps me save time with any one of those tasks, whether it's parent communications, whether it's, you know, designing student samples for essays as I'm trying to teach something in my English class, whatever it may be, if it's a differentiation task, you know, and I'm trying to make sure that all of the kids have um, examples that relate to their particular interest, whatever it may be, I would use one of those tools to try to create things that save me time. And I would add in there, Try prompts that are serious. Try prompts that are silly. There's nothing wrong with opening up Copilot or any of these and saying, tell me a knock-knock joke. Right. right. Just try something. You know, today was the last day of our marking period. I had to write those emails to parents. There's nothing wrong with going in and saying, write me a letter to this parent about their student who is not doing so well. And you, you don't have to send it, but just see what it comes back with. And what I like to do in the write me a letter um, kind of use case is write me a letter about, you know, student, you put the student's name in, you're, you're still protecting privacy because, you know, they don't know that student, you use the first name and you say, and I want to make sure that I tell the parent three things and you just put it in bullet point form and I need it to be two paragraphs long, I need it to come, whatever, however much you want to give it, and you'll see that it creates something for you. And then the other thing that I would tell the teachers who are just trying this out, remember that this is a chat. So if you don't like what it gave you, tell it to change something, yeah. right? So you don't have to take the initial output and then use it or say, eh, this doesn't work. Because where the, the real power comes in its, is in its ability to iterate based on feedback from you. I first got into chat GPT when I was redesigning my resume and I popped mm -hmm. it in and I popped the entire resume in and I said, make it better. Right. Because mm -hmm. that's basic. You're learning how to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was okay, but still on that overall horrible side. And so then I just ended up, I went bullet point by bullet point. Here's a thing that's on my resume. Please make this sound more professional. Mm -hmm. And Little by little, I just started carving out my documents. And then I went into my bio. Here's what I have. Please add these three or four new things. And then, you know, here it is. And, I, and then you put down, please give me this for a 
um, a, a job interview. Please give me this for my website. Please give me mm -hmm. this for a presentation. Please give me this in 150 words or less. And okay. again, whether you use them or not is a different kind, but you're just trying things and you're putting stuff out there. You're putting your toe in the water and seeing where it is. Um, obviously, you mentioned that you're, your team started doing this research last year. Where are you today? Where do you plan on being tomorrow? What's what what's what's in the future for your team in studying and in using and in sharing the knowledge about artificial intelligence with the world? Well, um, we continue to run experiments and do projects to help figure out how to save us time. So, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, we have our products in districts around the country. So we're always looking to make sure that our products meet the standards for all of these different states. And since we don't have a centralized curriculum in the United States, you can imagine that um, a large language model and, and different machine learning could help us look across all of the state standards um, to make sure that we have the alignment that we say we do. So that's one very popular project and one use that we're using um, AI for. But what we're continuing to do is to try to have conversations with our education partners and the folks in the schools who use our products and who are worried about our AI. And we're continuing to have um, this kind of internal experimentation so that we know how to advise our education partners. One of the things that I really enjoy about working for a company um, that really values educators first, like Edmentum does, is that we're not just trying to sell our products, we're really trying to be in relationship with those folks who use it and to understand their daily rea realities and to help them figure out um, how to make things work best for those daily realities. Talking today to Dr. Jane Lambers from Edmentum. Jane, where can we learn more about the great work you're doing and how do we get in touch with you if you have any other questions? I think LinkedIn is the best way to reach me and I'll make sure you have that to put in your show notes. And of course, you can find out more information over at edmentum.com. All of our show notes are going to be over there. This is Digital Learning Today. You can, of course, check out everything we have going on over at the TeacherCast Educational Network. Find out more information, like and subscribe, all that great stuff over at teachercast.net. Dr. Lammers, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. It was a pleasure. And that wraps up this episode of Digital Learning Today. I hope you guys had a good time and I hope you learned something that you can share with your faculty. There's one thing that we know here about artificial intelligence, it ain't going away. So have a good time with it. Let us know what you're thinking. And if you're interested, reach out to me. Would love to have you be a guest on the show as we get into the summertime. And that wraps up this episode of TeacherCast on behalf of Dr. Lammers and everybody here on TeacherCast. My name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you guys to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. You've been listening to the TeacherCast Educational Network, hosted by Jeff Bradbury. Please reach out to the show with all of your questions on Twitter at TeacherCast or online at www.teachercast.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And please take a moment to write a review in the App Store.